Coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Qualifying a lead is maybe the number one issue out there right now. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Byron, host of the Salesman Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. Of today's show, we have Dan McNade, the prospecting king, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. Dan shares a whole bunch of tips and advice on how to prospect better in the internet age. You can find out more about Dan over at pointclear.com. And with that all said, let's jump into today's episode. Hey, Dan, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Great to be here with you today. I'm glad to have you on, mate. You are, as far as I'm concerned, the king of prospecting. I enjoy your blog, which we'll come on to at the end of the show. You can give us a link to that. And there's a couple of things I want to dive into today that I think is going to have real impact to the audience. And where I want to start with all of this is to give us a kind of level playing field because this is such a confusing topic and it seemingly is so simple on the outside, but it's confusing internally. I've never had, I've never worked within a B2B organization that has had just this very first step nailed. And that is, Dan, can you give us a definition of what a lead actually is before we move on to what is, um, you know, prospecting, what is the qualifying side, qualification side of things? What is a lead? It's in the eyes of the beholder, I think, is probably the best answer. Um, and, and, and qualifying a lead is maybe the number one issue out there right now with companies. Um, and I'll take a step back and say, you know, before you can qualify a lead, you actually have to first qualify your target market. Once you've identified a target market, then you can use lead qualification criteria, which, by the way, I don't recommend using BANT, Budget Authority Need and Time Frame, or ANUM, which is something similar, because I think it overqualifies a lead. The problem is right now a couple of things. One is that sales executives and marketing executives really don't get together on the definition of a lead. One of the reasons for that is you might have one sales executive who is super hungry, doesn't really have enough to work on, so they're willing to have a conversation with anybody that will actually talk to them, almost sometimes without regard to their level of qualification. And they have other sales executives that are so busy that to them, you know, the only thing that looks like a lead to them is something that's going to sign within 90 days, which doesn't happen very often, at least in a considered or a more complex sale. I think what you have to do is say, um, my definition is is that you know you have to have an authority. There has to have a need. There's some sense of urgency. Why am I going to solve this problem now as opposed to why I didn't solve it six months ago? And then there needs to be some tweaking. Uh, one of the things that I recommend is companies establish what, what I refer to as a ju judicial branch between marketing and sales. So once a lead is a lead um, definition is established, whatever works for that specific company then the judicial branch kind of mediates between marketing and sales specifically by taking anything that sales either rejects proactively or simply doesn't work and figure out well what really happened was it because it did not meet the lead definition or it was because what serious decisions refers to as non-intuitive reasons that the sales rep called twice they didn't get a call back so they didn't follow up anymore they just decided it was a bad lead and that's why so many leads go into a black hole. And I think another example of you know what's wrong, and then I'll try to circle back around with what's right, is, is that we had a client a couple of years ago that sent 9,000 so-called leads out to the field sales force in one um, six-month period. I happen to know the VP of sales really well, not so much the VP of marketing, but the VP of sales said, we didn't get any leads last year. And I said, well, the VP of sales and marketing said they sent you 9,000 leads last year. Well, as it turns out, only 1.8% of those leads that they got actually were even qualified, much less a lead, you know, actual lead that sales reps could work on. So that's, that's really what the issue is. I, I get a lot of pushback. When I use, you know, instead of using budget authority, need and time frame, if you're only going after accounts that have a budget, the chances are you're going to lose because they're too far along in their evaluation to really seriously consider you as anything other than column fodder. And if you have a specific time frame, the same thing really occurs. Somebody's been in that account earlier than you. They've really kind of baked it. They've written the RFP. You know, they've already won the business for the most part. If you can go in there and, and block them in some way, you know, you might be able to get the business. But, you know, the best thing to do is to make sure that you're in early, you know, as opposed to in late. Um, so I use authority, need, some sense of urgency. Also, the decision making process, which is sort of a surrogate for the budget and the time frame. And, and typically, you know, at the highest level, that's what works. We also have things like the SIC code or the number of employees or the dollar revenue or what their current environment is from the standpoint of the technology that they're currently using. How's that? working out for them. 
and why should they consider another solution? You know, whether or not it's our client solution, should they consider another solution? And that's what we look for in lead qualification. You've given me a lot to go here, and I'm going to, at risk of going off on a total tangent here, Dan, I'm going to ask you about something that I think is you've brought up, which is is an important step before even probably the qualifying and the formal qualifying process, which we'll talk about in a second. And that is, if the person or the, the individual in the company that gets in there first uncovers that need, if they are most likely to, I don't know the statistics, but I assume that they are more likely uh, than someone coming in after the fact to win the business, because obviously they've got the opportunity to build a relationship, to set the expectations that their product is the correct fit, and, and multiple things that spin off from that. Should salespeople be actively, like, proactively going out there and doing their own prospecting and getting in front of people, or should they be reliant on the leads that come in? Because it seems to me that the leads that come in, they might be super hot to and, and qualified to do business, but they might be, you know, as you said, I, I like the phrase uh, column fodder. They might be just trying to get a, you know, a quote so they can put it in their spreadsheet to make the, the people they've already decided to do business with, you know, to to satisfy the criteria on that front. Yeah, I I want to, if I may, I want to read you something that um, wasn't sure if it was going to come up today, but. I'm glad it came up today, and that is a um, a quote from J Julie Schwartz at ITSMA, and uh, I have to get out my notebook because it's too long for you to remember the whole quote. But um, the um, and I think this I think this really says it all. You know, she says that the premise is that there's so much information available online that salespeople are thought to be unnecessary in the early stages of a sale. ITSMA's data says that for high consideration technology solutions, this is a myth. Um, so my point of bringing this up, because and this this goes on. If you ever want to, if you haven't read Julie Schwartz at ITMSA, she's excellent. But you know, the the reality is is that you have to get in early. Um, you don't wait until sixty or seventy percent of the sales process is complete before you engage. And I'm not saying that I don't necessarily agree with the pundits that say that you know the first one in always wins the business because if you happen to be in early enough then you can really steer the evaluation and you can kind of um, set up blocks for the competition. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to wait until 70 or 80 percent or however, whatever percentage you want to use. I've seen 57 to 90 percent is the range, but you don't want to wait until that much of the sales process is complete because, like you've said, they, they've already kind of baked in a competitor. Um, and the way I like to look at it is that if you wait until 60 or 70 percent of the sales process is complete, then, you know, 99.9 .9 percent of the time, a more agile competitor is going to have been in there early, have, have worked the relationships and, and will win the deal. But I wouldn't hesitate to get in, even if there's somebody that got in slightly earlier, I wouldn't hesitate to get in as long as you're in early. And what you're really looking for, if there's a real evaluation, is to get shortlisted. You know, if you can get shortlisted, then you have a chance to win the business. If you're late in the game, you're not going to get shortlisted. And let me just give some context for the audience for this of steering um, the the judgment and locking people out. So in my medical device days, the endoscopes that we used to sell and the camera systems that go along with it, they were all pretty similar. The differentiator for my company was that the service the kind of training that they did and they had the it was just it was the best company within the industry the longest running the most prestigious that essentially created a lot of the endoscopic um, procedures that uh, that people are using right now and are developed on from that so there was a, all this stuff like built built into the company in itself but there were a few technical differences between the camera systems so we would always if the surgeons were on board and become on board and they wanted to go with us but they had to go in the nhs in the here in the uk they would have to go to tender over a certain amount of thousand uh, dollars i think it's about one hundred twenty thousand dollars they'd go to tender so we would just encourage them to put the specifications of the tender to essentially lock out all the other camera systems because they didn't have the same specifics as ours the screen on the the image on the screen made no difference whatsoever they all looked very similar but there were specifics in the paperwork that we used to uh, lead people to be not able to compete with us so just to add a bit of context to that to the audience um but you also said something that was interesting to me of there's a lot of uh, to use your words over qualifying is this symptomatic of the fact that we're um we're told that we're only getting into the b2b um conversation 60 70 percent down the buying cycle and so we only deal with those prospects that are overqualified is there a benefit then to under qualifying prospects so we've got the opportunity perhaps to get in there earlier yeah I, I don't know that you're under qualifying them but i think that you're not putting out such strict qualification criteria as bant or annum 
Um, again, if you if you disqualify on the basis of B budget, and if you disqualify on the basis of time frame, then you're not going to be in very many evaluations, and you're not going to have much of a chance to win. So um, I, I think that's the biggest thing. At, at the same time, you know, there's an expression. In fact, I think I may have, may have read it in one of Dave Perlin's recent blogs. But the, you know, the expression was, you know, either get in and, and win early or lose early. You know, there's two winners in an evaluation: the, the the one that wins it actually, and the first one to get out. And so you know, want to make sure that you're doing enough qualification to say this is a good fit. You know, I've got the right people. It's the right environment. You know, we are a good solution for this. You know, you paint a vision of a solution for the buyers. And you know, if you do that, then you're going to you're going to at least get um, an opportunity to go deep into the evaluation, as opposed to you know sending your numbers in and basically losing on the merit of the fact that um, you you really haven't differentiated. And that's a critical point. That's a big problem for us is differentiating. Everybody says they have great people, process, and technology, and as those are not differentiators in today's marketplace. Tell us a little bit more about the budget side of things. So if you ring, you know, you, you're having a conversation with a prospect. That they are the authority. They have a need. They have some kind of urgency. You know, whatever pain point that they have is is ruining some other point of the business, or they need to get it solved. But they don't have budget. Seemingly, are for how to put it for a new salesperson, they might go, "Okay, fine, you don't have the money." Why in the world of B two B is that not um, such an important like part of the initial qualification? It's because if you're talking to the right people and they're expressing the right pain or need, however you want to put it. And you know, based on your experience, because you as a sales executive, you've solved this problem multiple times for other clients. And the client that you're talking to right now has not solved this once, you know, so you know that you know more than they do about what good solutions would be. So through that process, you know, you might come to the conclusion that this is not, this is not a good fit. We have a client right now where, you know, the, the larger they are, as the, the larger the prospect is as a company, the worse fit they are because they already have gone far enough and they have a sophisticated enough level of technology. They really don't need our client's solution. But if they're under a certain dollar amount, our solution is a great fit. It's relatively inexpensive. It modernizes everything they're doing. It allows them to grow, uh, maybe even grow out of our market. But you know, those are the things that we look for in, in, in the um, process of qualifying prospects for our clients. I mean, specifically, when someone says to you, uh, they match your other criteria, but they say, oh, we don't have money. Why do you not go, um, from our conversation so far, why do you not turn around and say, okay, they're not qualified? Why do you still consider them um, qualified? And I can, I can give a bunch of examples on this, but um, you know, I, I just want to drill into the audience that when someone says they don't have the budget in the world of B2B, that isn't like a, a, a kind of a, an end of the conversation a lot of the time. It, it shouldn't be because you know that whether it's six months from now or a year from now or even further out, that because of the work that you've done to identify or to understand the company, you know that they're going to have to do something. Whether they have budget right now or not, you know, what's the process for establishing a budget? What's the What does the process look like to put this where it's more um, timely or more within the time frame, an identifiable time frame, I guess is the best way to put it. Because if you're selling XYZ solution, then you know if their current environment looks like this and they're growing or they're shrinking or they're consolidating or whatever it is, you know, whatever the trigger events are, you know that they're going to have to do something. It's just a matter of time. The problem is, is that, you know, in, in a lot of cases with the sales executives, they get a lead that is too far out of their horizon and they're looking at it and saying, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to nurture this lead for the next six months to a year. That's not what I get paid for. I get paid to sell. And so a lot of those leads end up in a black hole and then they never see the light of day again. And all of that time and energy that you put against qualifying that prospect is wasted. And that's why that lead really should be pushed back to an inside sales team of some sort that can nurture and and continue to stay on top of that lead. And some of those will never buy. Some of them are going to buy, but a larger percentage are going to buy than, for example, if you have a 5% overall lead rate in, in, in nurture opportunities, you're going to have more like a 25% lead rate. Meaning that you, you, that's a rich source of future business that you don't want to just ignore, have it sit, that is, have it sit in the CRM, never to see the light of day again. <laughs> yeah, and and even more so. I mean, I've had experiences where people know that there's a problem and and, and they've no budget towards it, but as soon as you outline that you can give them a solution, as soon as you go down, as soon as you move, I guess, from prospecting to selling value and selling, you know, your expertise as the salesperson and 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 consulting with them. 
the budget just magically appears more often than not because as long as the need is bigger than yeah. the kind of spend that they were going to throw somewhere else uh, especially in the you know the, I, I find this especially in the bigger b2b deals if you can solve a problem that's big enough that you, they're having a conversation with you generally there's going to be money at some point isn't there there is and i think that there's another expression that i use when i'm talking to prospects and that is is that it doesn't ever seem like there's enough money to do it right but there's always enough money to do it second time, multiple <laughs> times. So, you know, if you go in and you basically can sort of future proof or, or provide some surety that, you know, this is this is the solution to go with, uh, then you've got a lot better chance of that deal. And, and you're going to know as a sales executive, if you're a good sales executive, you're going to know if basically there's you're getting fairy dust spread on you or if there's really something going on and and whether it's three months from now, six months from now, uh, you know, my, my favorite example of that is a, a big deal that we did with a, with a large, um, utility company. We were contacting CFOs and it took 90 days for the CFO to finally call back and say, don't stop calling me. You're my conscience. I've been extremely busy, but I do mm -hmm. want to talk to you. And, and 90 days later, actually five months later, that closed for a billion dollars. So, oh. you know, people, people said, well, it was 42 touches too many. No, it was actually in this case, just enough. And, um, that's, that's what you have to look at is, um, if you've got really talented salespeople who just don't have the time to make 42 touches over a 90 day period, then fair enough, that's fine. But then you have to give that work to somebody else so that they can stay on top of those parts of the market because you can increase your revenue from any given campaign by three times by simply doing better nurturing. And, um, I have a, one of the, one of our blogs has a, um, an infographic about that where instead of generating 50 leads, you're generating 153 leads from the same source of leads. That's a big difference. For sure. And is that just on, is it, is it as simple? Can we say it's simple as number of touch points or is it more complicated than that? It's just, just slightly more complicated, but you know, the outcomes of having conversations with the market are that you generate some leads, you have some pipelines, meaning that we have a specific next step within a reasonable period of time. And we have a high likelihood of converting that to a lead. And then we have what we refer to as nurturers, which is companies that are totally qualified. We've got the right people, but they're just not ready to take any action right now for whatever reason. And we set up trigger events for those. And we just make sure that we're watching that company over a period of time, just in case something happens. And then we we stay in touch with them. It might take three or four touch cycles. You know, we have a touch cycle that takes about 10 days, but we may have three or four touch cycles before we actually can convert that opportunity to a lead. And in our systems, you actually see all that. You see, here's where they started out. Here's where they were a year ago. Here's where they were three months ago. And here's where they are today. And that, that actually provides the sales reps with a little bit of background about that this really has been worked and this really is ready. And, it, and this is something that I should really work because it's it, it's got a high likelihood of at least my engaging in a significant enough conversation that I have a chance to win the business. And just give us a example of a trigger event for anyone who's listening who is unfamiliar with that. We've covered it before on the show, so we don't need to dive into it in too detail, but I think it's an important thing that with all the data that we've got through <laughs> just people's job changing on LinkedIn or companies being bought and sold, all, it's so much more public than it was perhaps 10 years ago that I don't want to just brush over that. If you've got an example of one that you can share. Oh, sure. Sure, I've got a couple. I mean, one of them is just yesterday, uh, it was announced that Windstream and Earthlink are merging in a $1.1 billion deal, including debt. And that's an interesting that's an interesting change because um, they uh, have been staffing up at Earthlink uh, with new marketing people. And now all of a sudden, they're going to be moving the headquarters to Windstream's headquarters, which I think is in Arkansas. So, um, you know, that's an example of a trigger event that on either side, whether it's on the Earthlink or Windstream side, um, th th there's there's something going on there. I know one uh, service provider to that company, this isn't us, but one service provider has a multi-million dollar deal in the works uh, with one of those two companies. And, you know, if I was them, I'd certainly want to know you first thing yesterday morning, what's <laughs> going on with Earthlink? Because I, I, um, I, I think that that could be important. The other thing is if, if you have a divestiture, um, we had a situation where we had a client that provided um, services, network operating services, and in a divestiture situation, if it's a really big company that has all these services built in, and you're being divested, and now you're and what, what does that mean? What does divested client. mean? I just don't want to. I don't want to gloss over anything here. Sure. You're being, you know, you're, you're being sold. Sure. Um, and we, what what was happening was is that the company was being sold, but they lost all of the infrastructure that they had when they were part of the mothership, so to speak. So they were desperate to find some help. Well, that was a trigger event that we put out because we anything going on in the the parent company 
we were looking for trigger events there. The other trigger events or the main trigger events are change in C-level executives or senior level executives. So if we, I have a trigger event on a lot of different things, even just personally that I look at, you know, going through Google alerts um, and, and it's pretty simple to do and it doesn't take an awful lot of time to review it, but it's very powerful if you're, you know, w instead of having to go into all of your context every day and look at it and say, I wonder what's going on here. Um, you know, it's an easy way to stay on top of things that are changing in your specific prospect market. Yeah. And just a final example on this for me, <laughs> a much, much smaller scale than the billions that you're talking about there, Dan, of um, one of our sponsors, the person who um, sponsored the show, the person who essentially sets all that up. She's super passionate about influencer marketing and bringing that to B&B &B was uh, B2B, whereas clearly at the moment, influencer marketing is more on the B2C side of things. She's moved on to a new agency who is representing an even bigger company within the sales industry. And uh, I saw this on LinkedIn, just sent her a quick email. No no pressure, no selling from my perspective whatsoever, just saying congrats, because uh, she's she brought in a, a bunch of revenue for us over the past 12 months. And her reply was, you know, <laughs> a, a very, uh, you know, straightforward kind of shoot from the hip email of, We'll get you into this place as well, and this this new company that she's representing is going to sponsor the podcast. And so that for me was a trigger event that you know very consciously I didn't try and sell her on it, um, but she's you know sold on the service that we provide, and so she's made that leap anyway. And with that, Dan, there's something that you've kind of alluded to here with uh, when you were talking about the number of touch points that you you had uh, before you got back in touch and reengaged with that C suite um, clients that we that you talked about earlier. And this leads me to something that I wanted to really dive into. We'll wrap up the show with this, I think. And that is, how do you prospect without sucking value from the customer? So, uh, sorry, how do you qualify from sucking value from the customer? So when you're first reaching out, there's an opportunity to add value. When you're past the qualification phase, perhaps, there's an opportunity to be consultative, to add value. Uh, you as an individual salesperson can add value to that individual that you're sat across or you're on the phone to. But to me, it seems that qualifying, you're asking a lot of questions to find out whether they're a right fit for you. And it's, um, you know, it, it almost seems a little bit selfish. Is there a way that in this process you can add value or is there a way to, you know, reframe it perhaps that you're you're helping them in that scenario so that you can have more engaging conversations? I think it's a great question. And I know that, that my, I personally, probably 20 years ago, um, I was the world's worst at asking a lot of questions. At one point, that actually worked. <laughs> you know, so, and, and I remember one, one session in, in particular that it, this was down in Atlanta, and finally it's like 55 minutes into the meeting, and the woman that I, who was the boss of everybody else that I was meeting with said, you know, we've only allocated five more minutes to this, and so far we don't know anything about you. That was kind of a lesson to me, you know, because I was asking questions and I was uncovering information, but that's not really why they allocated an hour. So that was a 20-year-ago lesson. I think that um, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said it isn't a matter of asking a bunch of questions because, you know, this, at the same time that the buying process, you know, is, is theoretically 60 to 70 cent per click, complete, 60 to 70 percent complete, which, of course, Julie Schwartz says is a myth. Um, what the buyers do expect you to do is they expect you to come very knowledgeable about their business. Uh, and you can do that by researching the same way they research vendors. You can do that by researching yourself. And I think, you know, one of the most powerful ways to do that is to call around the executive that you're trying to sell to or you're trying to get in front of and really do understand what their environment is. You know, call HR, call the COO, call, you know, other people in the organization to understand, you know, if it's a technology solution, what are they currently doing how's that working for them you know the, what what changes would they like to make are they aware i call it pain inducing questions are they aware of this issue this issue this issue so that they feel like you're going to be bringing a lot of expertise to them and again it goes back to something i said earlier that you know they're solving this problem one time and a really good sales executive has solved the problem multiple times for multiple companies and senior executives are really open to that i think that you know you you had mentioned um different kinds of marketing and um, uh, senior executives are two and a half times more responsive to a quality multi-touch campaign than they are, than the junior executives are. The junior executives are sometimes more responsive to marketing 
marketing automation as an example, which means that if you if you depend on marketing automation, just again as an example, um, you're going to get smaller deals with lower level decision makers than if you reached out to the more senior executives and you reached out you know with a call, an email, maybe a direct mail package, something to get in front of them, schedule time with the administrative assistant or the whoever's you know kind of um, curating the information that their boss is getting and and you know get in because you have something to say and it's not going to take very long for them to say yes uh, this is valuable or no it's not valuable and um, you really have nothing to lose and you have a lot to lose by waiting for them to come to you you have a lot to lose by going in and asking a bunch of questions that you should have been able to figure out before mm-hmm. we even in, engaged making sure that it's the right fit both for you and for them definitely and this is what i used to do again in medical device days of uh, you know the surgeon uh, they thought they were the decision maker but essentially procurement were the real decision maker so you get the surgeon mm-hmm. riled up you get them on board but before i'd speak to the surgeon i'd speak to the theater manager and i'd speak to the theater sister um it, or generally it was a theater sister in, in the theaters here in the uk and i'd essentially be really straight and up front with them and say what you know what what does your surgeon gets really pissed about what does he get really annoyed about in in your third sessions when is he throwing us or she, when is he or free he or she throwing a strop and getting in a mood and you know storming out and being a prima donna with things and a lot of it came down to the quality of the the glass in the endoscopes it hadn't been looked after there wasn't enough equipment so the turnaround time was too slow and so the patients you know obviously when people are being anesthetized it affects all the drugs that they've been given and it was very easy to do a quick couple of calls around especially it was obviously field sales i'd be in the theater to just run around every all the theaters around there and find out what's going on with everyone but not that I'm not stoking my own ego. I'm not saying I'm great here. But is this a differentiator between a top sales professional and someone who is average? Because it's a lot of work to do all this calling around. And so I imagine that there's a, bu- a good bunch of people listening to the show right now going, I don't think I'll bother with that. It seems like quite a lot of effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, there's a couple of staggering statistics that the. Uh, um, Miller Hyman Institute, part of uh, CSO Insights, produces, and and one of them is is that fewer than 60% of sales reps have made quota for the last three years in a row. I think last year it was about 58%, down from maybe a high of 63 or 64% coming out of the recession, but it's now back down under 60%. And a very small percentage of leads provided by marketing are actually worked by sales. And it's it's thought and by these studies that sales has to create about 60% of their own opportunities. So um, you don't really have a choice. Um, you, you, you're going to have to be proactive. You're going to have to get out there and, and reach out. An example sort of analogous to yours was that we were working with um, a device that measured um, – troponin in blood, um, which is obviously used primarily at the point of care or the emergency department. But in reality, and we were able to get this feedback to the client relatively quickly, it was the lab that was making all the decisions. Even though the emergency department wanted to try to take control over this, it was very (laughs) political and the lab was going to make the decision. So very quickly, we stopped making the lab mad at us by going to the doctors at the ER. And um, so that's kind of an analogous thing. And, you know, we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't had a lot of conversations with a lot of people and understood really what the environment was and why we weren't being successful you have to talk to the head nurse and she's going to tell you or he's going to tell you you know here's the reality Um, the lab's going to make the decision no matter what we say down here and okay fair enough let's go to a different target and i want to wrap up the show with this question dan in that is prospecting something that you do once for an account and we can perhaps touch on account-based marketing with this as well is it something that happens once at one time and then you reassess it you know a year later or is it something that we should be constantly going at? And should we be constantly adding value to a, an account as a whole specifically so that when the time comes that we are ready to sell to them, we can take action? And I guess this crosses both the world of marketing and sales here. Yeah, it's. I think that most companies are guilty of prospecting too broadly. Um, I've, I've told people that if you had a choice of spending um, $3 by sending something to three prospects or $3 by picking the best of the three prospects and spending that money on them, you know, it's really the latter that you should focus on. So it's, um, there's, there's no question that, um, uh, that it focus is very is critically important um, in the process of making sure that you're talking to the right people at the right time. Good stuff. Right then, Dan, well, I've got a couple of questions made to ask everyone that comes on the show. First one, what is one book or resource that you'd recommend to the Sales and Podcast audience? 
there's a guy by the name of Mike Weinberg who is an excellent speaker and an excellent author. He has a book called New Sales Simplified. Um, if you're a sales executive, I would highly recommend that book. If you're a sales manager, I would recommend Sales Management Simplified. They're both just very impactful and, and specifically New Sales Simplified talks about why a sales executive should prospect and a lot of information about how to prospect. Good stuff. We've had Daniel, uh, we've had Mike on the show, um, so we'll link to that book in the show notes to this episode over at salesman.red. Next one, Dan, Good. what is the biggest deal that you've ever closed, dollar size if possible? Um, I closed a million dollar deal in 2002, I think it was, and um, it, it was with a company that was a local company in the Atlanta area. Um, seven days later, they were acquired by Microsoft. Wow! <laughs> so uh, we only we only actually ended up uh, fulfilling about three or four hundred thousand dollars of that deal, and uh, it, it was a funny situation. But we probably don't have time for it right now. It wasn't funny at the time. But no. it was a funny situation. <laughs> and. Uh, so I was I was elated when on July the first, you know, I, I signed this big deal and everything looks like roses. And then mm. uh, seven days later, I've got a new boss at Microsoft and everything has changed. So, oh, no. <laughs> with that down, mate, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Well, I, I have to do this. Uh, there's a, there's a guy who unfortunately passed away this last year. And you're talking about salespeople I know because everybody said, well, what about Zig Ziglar or all these other guys out there? <laughs> I don't know them. I've read their stuff. But a guy by the name of Tom DiPrizio who passed in 2016, he was one of the, he was probably the best salesperson I ever saw work a room. Uh, he was just relentless. Um, sometimes when I thought he was overkilling it, we, I'd walk out and think we're dead and people would be patting him on the back and saying, hey, great job. <laughs> that was fantastic. We're going to do business together. So I learned a lot from him and I was sorry to see him go this year. And is that down to levels of things like charisma and, and that kind of thing? Because as you tell that story, that's what I get from him. I can imagine this really charismatic guy. He was very charismatic, but he was also really meticulous and methodical. Um, you know, he would pick apart things that um, one of the things we did is there was a company that became a joint venture and they were two, two totally opposite cultures. And we were brought in to basically write sales management and sales training for this company. And to watch him kind of pick apart the, the objections that each side had because they were really pointing the objections at the other side to see him go through that process was just it, it was a it was a work of art and so but he was very process driven mm -hmm. he knew his stuff from a sales standpoint but he was really he was articulate he was just very dynamic and um, i think it all added up to a, a great big picture amazing stuff and dan i've got one final question for you mate so i'm going to ask everyone that comes on the show and that is if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? We probably have talked about this. Um, I, you know, I, I thought about this question um, and I would say that, you know, being better at prospecting. Um, sometimes when you have a company like ours, you know, you don't spend as much time and attention on your own prospecting as you do on your clients prospecting. And as a result, <laughs> you know, you, you lose out. So one of the things I'm doing right now is I'm going through salesforce.com and I'm reactivating some accounts that were either old clients or, and I'm going out and I'm, linking in and trying to connect with people who moved on to another company and um you know really just beginning at the at the at, at, at starting with the beginning and, and, and in a sense starting over to make sure that we we build we have a 20,000 name database and i sometimes say you know companies have a choice of either scrapping it all and starting over or cleaning up the entire database and neither one of those are good options so we're going through and figuring out you know how can we come up with a thousand or 1200 accounts that are the very best accounts for us to go after and then staying focused on them definitely and i always feel that and again for medical advice sales i only had a pretty small territory in that it was like Yorkshire around here. So Leeds, Bradford, York, Hull for everyone in the UK will know this kind of area uh, well. It's pretty small. And so I had the benefit of having a finite amount of accounts versus someone who's perhaps in SaaS sales might have almost an unlimited amount of accounts to go at. But I knew that having the finite amount worked, it, it worked in my brain because I could focus and narrow down and spend time with and prioritize things correctly. But you not not for you specifically, but for the industry, do you know how many uh, through CRM leaks, through salespeople bouncing it back to marketing and marketing bouncing it back and things going into the black hole that you described, do you know how many qualified leads never get sold to because of you know process-driven uh, kind of dropouts? I, I don't know exactly, but, but I would say that it's at least 
sixty percent of them. Wow! Because uh, the the same CSO Insight study said that only forty two percent of marketing generated leads are actually followed up by sales, and that's pretty recent information. So, um, you know, it's approaching sixty percent, and it's a lot of times it's for non intuitive reasons. You know, I I I got the lead, I called them, they didn't call me back, so they must <laughs> not really have been a lead. And oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to let you know that. You know, it's sitting in CRM as a marketing qualified lead, and that's where it'll stay forever unless something different happens. Definitely. And the reason I asked that race specifically is because, uh, from personal experience, from having like yourself as a you know the the prospecting king on the show, the the number of leads, the number of deals, the number of the amount of business that is just lost in the pipeline itself from everyone I speak to is incredible. There was you know if it's you know anywhere near sixty percent, I was expecting you to say five six percent. Uh, if it's anywhere near that, it's clearly worth anyone who's listening to this going perhaps back over uh, the pipeline to, you know, make it a routine, perhaps, you know, once a year, once a quarter, wherever it is, depending on the numbers, to re-engage with these people because clearly it's, well, 60%, that's the difference between hitting target or not if 40% of people uh, are missing it, isn't it? It really is. And we, we once worked for, a, it was about a $200 million company in the Washington, D.C. area. And about once every quarter, we would all get together. And I'm talking about the VP of sales, the VP of marketing, president of the company. I was involved in this because they were my account. And we would go around the room talking about, you know, the status of leads. And every three months, it would take us a couple of days to do this. There were, there were only something in the order of 20 sales reps. And I one time said to these guys, I said, you know, we could, we would be better off spending our time right now calling every one of these 20 sales reps and and telling them to put a gun to their head and tell us, you know, are you going to, what number are you going to hit? Who's going to actually buy and who's not going to buy? Is it because we're, we're wasting a lot of time here and what you're going to get from the, from the sales executives is you're not going to get much. You're going to, you know, one or two accounts that really have focused on the other accounts that they have, they have no idea what's going on. And at least you'd know, you know, at least you'd know, okay, well, maybe I need to reassign these to another rep that's not quite as busy, or maybe I need to fire somebody or promote somebody <laughs> or whatever. But, and they never, they never did know. And they actually ended up selling in a fire sale. It was a great company and they ended up selling in a fire sale because they couldn't basically get their arms around this one really specific thing, which is the effectiveness of the sales rep following up on leads mm. well that just you know emphasizes how powerful that is and with that dan tell us a little bit about point clear and then tell us a little bit about your blog as well because there's a lot of great content on there oh thank you i appreciate that we provide lead generation qualification and nurturing services and, and it's funny because when account-based marketing became so red hot just this last year maybe two years now um my coo and i are on a telephone conversation and she said isn't that what we've been doing for the last 20 years and i said yeah we really have been and account-based marketing isn't a new concept it's been around for a long time but the, the difference between, you know, kind of the typical marketing and account-based marketing, I'll just give you a quick example. We had a company that sent us, or a client that sent us 4,200 contacts at 75, and 75, 4,200 companies and 7,500 contacts. And they said, we want you to call every contact at every company. We're looking for hospitals that have 300 plus beds. And we're also looking for the equivalent of this chief experience officer. And we looked at it and said, you know, well, first of all, there aren't 4,200 hospitals that have 800 beds in the U.S. or 300 beds in the U.S., um, so as it turns out on this list, uh, there were actually 803 hospitals that had 300 plus beds and only 365 of them were on the list of 4,200 that they sent us. So we ended up being able to, d to deliver probably twice the value because we had that many more prospects mm -hmm. for less than a third of the cost. It would have cost us $175,000 to do this project their way, it cost us $50,000 to do it our way. And we ended up being able to provide a lot more value for that money. So that, that's a, that account-based marketing process that we use is really important to our lead generation qualification and nurturing. As far as the blog is concerned, you can go to pointclear.com and the, one of the tabs at the top is blog, or you can go to pointclear.com forward slash blog. And we try to have, or we do have um, copy or, or content from me at least once a week. And we also bring in guest bloggers. I also about once a quarter will reach out to 20 or 30 industry experts, um, including Mike Weinberg um, and Joe Conrath and a number of others, Dave Curlin, and ask them questions about something that's topical. And um, we publish those. Usually they're multi-part uh, blogs. But um, the, the, you'll, if you go into the blog and you look back just a few blogs, you'll see one of those articles. And I think you'd find that very interesting. Good stuff. Well, we'll link to the last one of those that you did in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.red. And with that, Dan, mate, I want to thank you for your insights. I want to thank you for being 
So my background is chemistry. The regular listeners will know this. I'm quite analytical minded, you know, science minded. And I like your approach to all this. I like the fact that when I ask you a question, more often than not, there's a quote or there's data or there's something behind it, which is, you know, makes you stand out, mate, as a guest. So uh, stroke your ego a little bit there because I do appreciate that from a guest when they come on the show. And with that, Dan, I want to thank you for your time, you know, your expertise, and for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Thank you, Will. I appreciate it. It's good to be with you. And there we have it. Dan, thank you for coming on the show, mate. I appreciate your time and your insights as always. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning into this episode on YouTube. Make sure that you click like. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure you click subscribe as well so you don't miss any of the future podcast episodes that we put out. And with that all said, I'll speak with you again on tomorrow's show.